So I think we're going to make a start now. My name is Sue Shard I'm a software engineer, coding instructor, tech writer and event MC. I'm going to be moderating and facilitating today's panel discussion on how to land your first developer job. And we've got five really great brand new developers. They've all uh, just got their first dev role in the past year. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each of them to give us a quick intro uh, to themselves. Just a quick intro into how you learnt to code, what you're doing now, what you're doing previously, and what stack you're working with, please. So can I come to Beth first? Everyone, can you hear me okay? We can. Great. So my name is Beth Myrie. I live in Connecticut in the US. And I just started my first developer job um, at the beginning of this year, so I'm still very new. Um, I, I have a little bit of a non-traditional background. So my original um, bachelor's degree was in linguistics and German. And then I got a um, master's in environmental engineering, totally different. And then I guess every decade I like to totally change. So then I uh, just recently graduated from Oregon State University with a bachelor's in computer science. So, so how I ended up on that path, I, I worked primarily in nonprofits um, and ended up, my last full-time role was at a um, translation company. And I got really interested in the tech side of, of things while I was there. So I, I started trying to do a few online courses um, through Coursera, things like that. And I just didn't quite have, like I needed more structure and accountability. So I enrolled in um, a bachelor's degree program, but it was a post bac BS. So we only um, had to take the basic, or we only had to take the computer science classes, not all of the um, general education classes. Um, and I just wanted to say I was 37 when I started learning to code and I graduated at 40. So if anyone is, um, is transitioning into tech and is, is not in their early 20s, like don't worry, it's totally possible. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I, I had an internship at Intuit last summer and I started working at um, Viasat at the beginning of the year. And Suze, uh, I'm not sure if I covered all of your questions. <laughs> Which stack are you working with at the moment? Just so folks can uh, see if they can relate to what you're doing. Sure, so I, um, I'm a little more on the DevOps side. So um, uh, working on, um, on AWS and I'm sort of really interested in, in deployment. And I'm also um, just starting to learn more about um, authentication and different protocols that are used for that. Cool, that's definitely different. I think uh, a lot of folks that are watching today are still learning about the kinds of roles that they can get in tech and maybe just thinking it's probably just start with web development, but actually that might not be the case. So thanks for that, Beth. Yeah. Ashley, can I come to you next? So tell us what kind of software you make, where you work now, what you did before, and how you learned to code. Sure. Um, so I'm currently a software engineer at a company called FastGrabbit, um, based in San Francisco. Um, prior to this, I actually enrolled in, in Flatiron School, um, which is a software engineering boot camp. And uh, yeah, don't have a CS background at all. I actually studied fashion in college, like totally unrelated, um, and was working in marketing uh, for a few years in New York. And was just like doing a lot of um, kind of like web development adjacent work, like uh, a lot of like Google Analytics, um, you know, doing tracking on websites. And I started learning JavaScript to just kind of like be better at like the work that I was doing and just out of a personal interest. And, um, and then that kind of spiraled into doing projects on the weekend and sometimes doing projects at work because that work is more enjoyable. Um, and it just got to a point where I was like, okay, like I just want to do it. I had I was in the same situation as Beth, like I was trying to do Coursera courses, but there just wasn't that structure. Uh, so I left and kind of made the jump and um, went to Flatiron School and it worked out. And um, a few months after the program, got a job at TaskRabbit. Um, and yeah, the tech stack that I'm working in, I'm, I'm a full stack engineer with a, a primary focus on front end. So um, working re uh, React, Redux, um, and the back end is Ruby on Rails. Um, so that's kind of the stack that I'm working in. Um, I think that those were all the questions. Um, yeah, sorry, it was a lot of questions, wasn't it? Um, but yeah, and also thanks Ashley, Beth and Ryan for getting up so early 
Ashley and Ryan are on the west coast of America. For those of you that don't know, that is eight hours behind the UK, so it's 7.22. <laughs> so not only are they up, they're up and ready to work. I'm so impressed. And Beth is on the, uh, the east coast of the USA and it's still early there. So um, Beatrice, can I come to you next? Which uh, tech stack are you working with? What kind of software do you make? What do you do now? And what did you do, pre what did you do previously, please? Yeah, so previously I worked in finance. I'm currently a front end intern. Um, so I started teaching myself how to code, I think roughly about two years ago. So using free code camp. And then I met a volunteer of code bar at a hackathon and she was just like, yeah, you should come along to code bar. So I started attending like evening classes with code bar. And I was like, I really love this because initially I thought I would just keep coding as like a hobby on the side. And then I discovered like, I love this more than what I'm currently doing now. So I continued teaching myself how to code on the side whilst working. And then I think roughly about um, at the end of 2019, I started like, I was like, I'm gonna start applying for jobs. Like the worst that they can say is no. And actually the best thing was they actually started giving me feedback saying like, you need to improve your JavaScript skills. You need to improve your JavaScript skills and your technical skills. So um, I made a decision to um, attend a coding boot camp. So I left my job at the beginning of 2020 and I did a coding boot camp. Initially, I didn't want to, but I thought, okay, this will give me the, the chance to just focus on improving those technical skills and to be able to get my job. Um, I did my coding boot camp and I graduated like middle, like bang right in the middle of COVID-19. So it was really difficult for me to get my job, but luckily enough, I was able to find an internship in October last year. So I've been in my role for six months and within my role, um, I'm mainly do, like, doing front end and like shadowing with my seniors. So like um, doing pair programming, picking up tickets and creating features. Um, I did an internal project with UJS, so I've learned UJS and currently I'm learning and uh, building a project with React. I hope that answers all your questions. It does, definitely. And it's generated a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so uh, what I'd like to mention at this point as well is that some of you good folks who are watching today are familiar with Cobar. Others of you I know have probably just seen a tweet about Cobar Festival, so you know nothing about Cobar. And Beatrice did touch on Cobar just now uh, when she did an intro. So Cobar's a charity. It's international and basically it is a place where you can sign up and get coached if you want to learn to code. So you're paired with an experienced um, coder and they will take you through whatever you uh, want to learn about. And that is completely free of charge. It was in person until uh, COVID hit and now it's all online. So if you go to codebar.io, you can see how to sign up as a uh, student if you're more experienced, feel free to sign up as a mentor. We're always happy to get more coaches on board. What I'd also like to mention as well, because people have been asking about boot camps, there's a couple of folks here on the panel that have attended boot camps. Cobar has a long relationship with Makers Academy, which is a London based boot camp. We've been uh, partnered with them for about three years now. And at the moment, Makers is offering six people the opportunity to study their boot camp for free. It's a 12 week boot camp. And the cohort starts in July. So it's by application. It's not first come, first serve. The applications are going to be assessed, but there's a good two and a bit weeks left to apply. So go to uh, cobar.io. I'm also going to ask Bruno or Helen, one of the moderators, to drop the link in the chat, please, to the application form and the info. If you're interested in that, read about how to apply and fill in that application. Like I said, you've got a good two and a bit weeks to do that. And then if you're successful, you get to study the Makers Academy Bootcamp completely for free. If you're not, not successful for that, with that, thanks Kimberly for dropping the link. If you're not successful with that, uh, Cobar, like I said, has got a very good relationship with the Makers and they do offer discounts through the year. So don't lose heart, there are definitely opportunities out there for you if you don't have access to boot camps or master's degrees. So uh, thank you, bitches, for your intro. Ryan, can I come to you next, please? So just a reminder. <laughs> stack that you're working with at the moment, the type of software that you're building, what you did before and what you're doing now, please. Absolutely. Um, good morning or good afternoon, good night, whatever time it is in where you are. That time. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's definitely a pleasure to speak to you guys from uh, San Francisco. 
Um, I'm currently at Lyft, which is a, a rideshare company. Many of you guys, you know, have taken Uber. Lyft is not uh, in the UK yet, uh, but definitely something that um, is something that I want. I'm not quite sure if it lines up with the business's goals, but something that um, I want to see us uh, being in in the future. Uh, but um, how I learned to code, um, I was actually, I entered um, the University of Southern California where I went to college uh, as a computer science major. And uh, kind of in my first class, there was a black and green terminal screen up uh, and I had no clue what that was. And I said, this is not for me. Um, and I kind of, you know, dropped out of the major and picked up economics and kind of made a commitment to myself. Okay, you know, whatever role I get into, uh, it's going to be tech adjacent. So like still keeping my eyes on tech. Um, I, you know, joined finance um, and kind of got to work closely with engineers once I um, joined Lyft. And I said, you know, this is something I still really want to do. And it's not looking like there's going to be an opportunity for me to kind of learn on the job. Uh, we were, you know, pre-IPO at that time, wasn't going to happen. So I decided to leave, go to a boot camp. Uh, I went to Hackbright, which is a boot camp for all women. Um, rejoined Lyft as an apprentice, which is similar to an internship. And yet, um, uh, I guess the only difference is that it's for people with non-traditional backgrounds, people who are not fresh out of college, uh, did that. That turned into a internship and the full time started in May of last year. Um, and kind of the stack that I worked with um, initially in my apprenticeship was Angular JS and Python. Um, now it's strictly Python. I'm uh, tending more towards the back end, uh, but I think my mentor and my team are going to start giving me some React tickets. So hopping back into my full stack bag soon. Cool. Yeah, that's so interesting that you essentially kind of had to leave and come back to, to get into the tech. Thanks for sharing. And absolutely. Jenny, sorry, Ryan, were you going to say? You said absolutely. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I had a similar experience, uh, but unfortunately couldn't go back because the company that I was working for was not really geared up with the whole tech thing. So sometimes it's a bit better to just leave and uh, find somewhere that is. Jenny, last but not least, uh, what kind of software are you building? Which tech stuff are you using? What did you do before and what are you doing now? I a bit similar to Beth really, have worked in, in a lot of areas. I did a film degree um, many years ago, 12, 15 years ago, and ended up working in design in a company that made furniture for yachts. And I really enjoyed it. I stayed there for seven years and I worked my way up to a senior project manager. And then there came a point where I thought if I want to advance any further in my career, I'm gonna need to move company. And once I started actually looking at different companies, I thought, I don't, I'm not sure I actually want to do this. And then this little spiral set off like, oh, well, what do you want to do? Um, and I thought, well, I reckon I could code. Like I was, I was all right at science and I was all right at languages. And it's kind of just like science and languages. But before I committed to anything, I thought you're going to have to make sure that coding is what you think it is in your head. So I spent about three months every evening on um, Code Academy, just doing little little tutorials, little exercises, until I felt like, okay, yeah, I understand what this is. I understand that I know nothing. Um, and at that point, I committed to a boot camp at um, IO Academy in Bath, which was about an hour from where I was living. And like Beatrice, I think you did this all during COVID. This was all in the middle of COVID for me as well. And my family were like, you're crazy. Why are you doing this? Why are you quitting a job? Uh, but I started the bootcamp in September last year. It was brilliant. We were in person very briefly um, until the lockdown in October kicked in again in England. And then we went remote. I graduated in December, at which time I had uh, a handful of job offers and I accepted one at Accenture in Newcastle, which is seven hours away from where I was living. So I had to move. Um, it's a, 
it's an unusual role. It's a master's degree apprenticeship. So a day a week, I'm at university getting a master's degree in software engineering, which is brilliant because my bachelor's degree is in film. So it wasn't something I ever thought I'd be able to do. Um, and then the other four days a week, I work within Accenture as a, an app developer. And I'm currently working on some really old legacy software, which is uh, Java and XML at the moment. Wow. Okay. Definitely very different. So a lot of you folks have got a similar route into professional software development. A lot of you have come through boot camps. You all came to the boot camp from a different place and you're all doing different things now. So hopefully that gives folks uh, something in there that they can relate to, whether it was what these people were doing before, uh, how they felt about what they were doing. And, you know, there were a couple Actually, I think everybody here is a career changer, including me. So uh, hopefully what you're taking away from this is it's never too late. Even if you think you're established in your career, I guess the best uh, time to have made a change was five years ago and the second best time to make a change is now, isn't it? It's today. So um, what I'd really like to know, because this is all about how to land your first developer job, I'd like to hear some real talk about numbers. I don't want to put anyone off um, and make them feel like it's impossible but I think we need to kind of give people the reality of what it's like to actually look for that job so Beatrice I'm going to come to you and I'm going to ask you um, what would you say the ratio of applications was to interviews like how many jobs were you applying for and um, and how did that translate into interviews and jobs off, job offers? That's a difficult question um, I think I lost count of how many companies I um, applied for and how many recruiters that I spoke to that kind of like, in a sense, didn't reply back. Cause I, I used like trying to apply for myself, like just self applying. And I also tried to use recruiters. So because I graduated in May, 2020, that was literally like in the middle of when COVID was happening, when I think junior developer jobs were like drying up and all the jobs I saw were mainly like senior developers. So I had, I had applied to so many jobs and I really wish I could put a number on it, but like I applied to so many jobs and in the end, I think roughly, I'd say summer of 2020, I got about three interviews. So out of all the, like the, the, the like loads of jobs I applied for, I initially just got like three interviews which was um i'm very grateful for but I, I feel the amount of work i put into all the applications i was just like wow i got three out of this I, I only got three interviews so it was it was very difficult um but i'm very grateful that i got an interview at, at least because that means they were reading my cv and they really liked what was on my cv yeah would you say that it was almost like a full-time job applying for a full-time job <laughs> <laughs> definitely like I was waking up I was like noting down like this is the job I need to apply for I need to add this on my CV I need to change this about my cover letter and it literally became like a routine where I would have like list of jobs to apply for and like ticking off like on a checkbox yes I done this today and then like moving the next applications to another day saying like this is my work for the next day which was a lot it like applying for a job is like a full-time job <laughs> Yeah, yeah, actually, that is something that people say, isn't it? You, you need a routine because it's really easy to get disheartened, isn't it? Like you say, Beatrice, you're applying for so many things. And it wasn't even a case of necessarily getting rejected. It was people weren't getting back to you. Yeah. So just to kind of keep yourself going, kind of need some sort of structure around it. And also not to forget, because sometimes you might see a job that's been advertised by the company. Then you go and look on a website and you see the same job. And it's been advertised by an agency you kind of don't want to apply for those two and then kind of like oh well, i don't know what i'm doing and who i'm talking to um so yes so beth i'm going to come to you now um what were you looking for in your first jobs because you had you've got a bit of a different uh stack to everybody else haven't you although your journey isn't too different. Yes, okay, you took the degree and everything, but what were you looking for when you when you went to get your first developer job? Well, something that I I told myself a lot was I should try to focus on <clears throat> making the decision after I had the offer. So instead of focusing so much on what I was looking for 
right off the bat, I would sort of try to get the offer and then and then see which was the best fit. Um, but luckily, the off the offer that I ended up accepting was actually what I was looking for. So yeah, I mean, I've I find that I'm much more interested in like the site reliability, um, DevOps side of things than actually working on the code itself. Um, so that's that's kind of what I was what I was looking for. And if I could just touch on um, <clears throat> what you were talking about earlier about sort of getting discouraged and you know the numbers of places that you've applied for, I. I knew that was going to happen. I mean, I knew I was going to send out just, you know, dozens of applications. And so um, actually early on when I was looking for my internship, I started a group of students um, at my university who we were competing um, for number of rejections. <laughs> so it actually was, it's, it's still going strong. Um, there's like a monthly competition and um, it's fantastic because it helps you really focus on the process and um, also helps you kind of stretch to apply to things that you're um, maybe think you won't that you'll get rejected for but then you're like well it, you know it'll just help my rejection count so um, that's my that's my major piece of advice is to focus on increasing your rejection count and you can't count ghosting so you have to follow up if they ghost you until you actually get the official no Oh, I love that. And um, if you can team up with other people, then it helps to share the pain a bit and you know that you're not the only one in that situation. But definitely anything in life, if you can gamify it, it probably helps it to, <laughs> helps the time pass a little bit easier, doesn't it? Um, and also rejection is a really good way to learn, isn't it? It is really horrible. But if you can wiggle some feedback out of those people that are rejecting you, then hopefully it can up to improve for um, next time. So Ryan, we've had a question that's been specifically directed at you. So when you were talking about Lyft, you, you talked about your journey there and, and how you felt like you wanted to get into um, coding. And then you said that the um, Lyft was pre-IPO. Somebody's asking what pre-IPO means. And also as a follow up, they're asking when they're looking for a new employer, should they look for a well-established company or a small startup? Which environment do you think is best for learning? Are great questions. Um, Pre-IPO, IPO means a public offer or initial public offering. And um, that's basically the um, pre-IPO stage is before you are publicly owned or before you're listed on the stock exchange. And this is one of the many quote unquote exits of a startup. Startups can either fail be, uh, be acquired by another company or, you know, be listed on the stock exchange for uh, public sharing. Um, and so um, uh, the second question was around um, kind of which company is best, whether that's yeah. startup or uh, larger companies. I think there are pros and cons to both for sure. Um, I started off at a larger company um, Deloitte and I got a lot of, you know, professional experience, gained a lot of professional contacts. When I went to, uh, Lyft, I think it was like a hundredth of the size because Deloitte is like a hundred K plus, you know, across the world. Lyft at the time was, uh, no more than a thousand people. Um, and I think there are definitely benefits to both. So my advice in that is, you know, making your expectations clear um, when you are applying for the job, not only, you know, is it a, a, a chance for you to sell yourself, but it's also an opportunity for the company to sell themselves. So if you make it clear, you know, I'm trying to learn X, Y, Z, uh, in addition to, you know, bringing my skills, um, I think you will find your, your, your answer really quickly. In addition to um, asking people uh, outside of like your hiring manager or team, kind of what the culture is like on a day to day um, that can hopefully guide your decision. Yeah, I think definitely for the folks that um, are eligible to come to COPA, so for the underrepresented groups, I think culture is definitely really important. There's nothing worse than getting there and realizing that actually it's not inclusive and they don't value you and they don't actually want you. Um, so definitely um, make sure that you're happy with that. And it is really hard because it's hard to get a job anyway without kind of 
wanting to seem choosy, but this can have a really big effect on your mental health. So I'm really glad that you mentioned that, right? So Ashley, like a lot of people on this panel, uh, you attended a boot camp. Can you tell us a little bit about what help the boot camp gave you to get employment after you had finished studying? Was there any sort of uh, employment program or coaching or anything like that? Yeah, um, at Flatiron School, everyone was paired with a career coach and the career coach would, it was like, it was very structured um, and it lasted for, I didn't make it through the entire um, like cadence of the career coaching, but it lasted about six months for a lot of people. Um, and what like that would, like in the structure would give you um, like weekly kind of targets to meet in terms of job applications. Um, the career coach would review, review your resume or CV um, and give feedback on that. They'd share it with their like with other career coaches, so you just get like extra eyes looking on it from like more of a like recruiter's perspective. Um, so so they provided that kind of structure after the boot camp, which was really great. They didn't just kind of like they're like okay, you're done, like push us away, like good luck and stuff. Like they tried their best to definitely provide like continue that structure of the boot camp because. Uh, you're just like in it every single day for like three or four months, you know, all day coding, like all day working, having that structure. Um, and so very much um, appreciated them kind of trying to continue with that um, post boot camp. And um, once you found a job, then you kind of like, uh, you know, obviously didn't have to attend the, those meetings anymore. Um, but it just kind of provided that like, uh, yeah, like help and guidance and also support um, if you're like feeling discouraged because it, it is truly just a numbers game. Um, like I think I applied to like 100 or 200 jobs, like I don't remember. And it's just like, it's so random almost, it feels like when you hear back. Um, but yeah, so definitely uh, enjoyed like the post boot camp experience um, as well as the in-person boot camp experience too. Yeah, and like you say, uh, we talked at the beginning about numbers and like you say, you apply to a couple of hundred, you do need to keep track of them because if somebody does call you back, you might be quite surprised, but you don't particularly want to like, oh, which job's that again? Like, it's not going to give a good impression, is it? So you do need to be very organised. I'm just curious, actually, Ashley, um, did your boot camp have relationships with employers that they could put you in touch with or was it purely around how to make yourself more employable? So, like, you know, you're your kind of your CV and those assets or could they put you in touch with employers as well? I think there were a few employers that they could but it was more of like contracting roles. Um, in this I, I went to I finished the boot camp before COVID so I was feeling like a little bit more picky so I was like oh like that's not what I want like at this moment and stuff if I was like if it was during COVID I think that I would probably like widen my um, uh, the opportunities that I was looking into um, so they had some relationships with some companies, but mostly contracting roles, which I just wasn't interested in. Um, but yeah, was there a second part to that question? Sorry. Um, no, it was just, do they have relationships with companies that, you know, that normally take on uh, bootcamp grads? Because I know like in London, there are, um, Makers has got relationships with companies and some of the other bootcamps have as well. And some companies are kind of well known for taking a lot of bootcamp grads which is really good because they know what somebody realistically can do once they've come out of a boot camp there aren't any like really high expectations or the wrong expectations they're not going to expect them to know the deep computer science stuff because there simply isn't enough time to learn that in in 12 in 12 weeks so um at that point i'm just going to mention as well um that code bar has got a job board and because Cobar is geared towards folks who are learning to code or just got up to about six months of um, experience, um, we have employers advertising on the Cobar job board. So do check that out. If you are a hiring manager, you are very welcome to advertise your entry level jobs on the Cobar job board for a nominal fee. You can find out all about that on the Cobar.io website. And I'm sure Kimberly will drop a link to that in the chat shortly. So Jenny, I'm going to come to you now. You have got quite a different uh, role from everybody else on the panel. So you're studying for a master's alongside your day job. Can you tell us a bit about what the prerequisites for that are? Do you have to have a first degree uh, to, to go onto those schemes because it's a master's? Because uh, I'm sure that a lot of people are quite interested in this. 
this particular one is, um, as far as I'm aware, it's pretty unique. It's a, a government based initiative um, to do with all the reskilling um, stuff that they were talking about last year. So the prerequisites for this master's were only that you had a previous degree. The subject of that degree, it didn't matter. And in fact, I think all 12 of us are non STEM graduates. Having said that, it has been my experience that I am coping with the content of it a lot better than the people who come in having not done a boot camp at all. Um, and a lot of it overlaps with what I learned at boot camp, which is, to be honest, a credit to the boot camp, the fact that I'm doing a master's and they're teaching us the same stuff. Um, but I am picking it up a lot more easily than the people who are opening up IntelliJ for the first time and thinking, oh my God, I don't know what to click on and what does what. Um, so yeah, I feel really lucky that I've managed to get onto, onto a master's degree with without a computer science degree previously, but I also feel like I'm adequately prepared. Yes, yeah, definitely. Like you say, the prerequisite that it was that you had a bachelor's, but it didn't matter which subject it was in, uh, because you've got a boot camp, then you were a bit better placed to kind of to pick things up quickly. And I think this is the thing about going on a boot camp, is that by going on a boot camp, you can prove to an employer, especially if you've got something that you can show for it. So you've got an app or a project or something that you produce in a boot camp that you can learn quickly because on a boot camp, you don't have any other choice. It's like 12 or 16 weeks long and it is intense. I'm not going to lie to anybody who's watching here today. It is really intense. So it's, it's not for everybody, but for a lot of people, it is a good way to learn, especially if you have been trying to teach yourself some of the folks in this panel were trying to teach themselves and then uh, decided to go on a boot camp and did it that way. So in terms of looking for opportunities, Jenny, I'm going to come to you again. How did you actually come across this opportunity and where were you actually looking for entry level roles? Where, where were the sources that you were looking for these jobs? So I was coming to the end of the boot camp in December, which in my head, I thought, oh, that's so nice. It's the end of the boot camp, the end of the year. That's a really nice kind of symmetry. But in practice, it was a terrible idea because I was hunting for jobs right before Christmas. People weren't advertising. I was panicking that I was going to have no income in the next year. And I just paid out for this boot camp and I really needed income. So I was applying everywhere. I had my CV up on generic job boards like Indeed. Um, the Academy had thrown a hiring event for us. So they do have hiring partners around Bath and Bristol. Um, and I was talking to, to those people. Aside from that, I was on Twitter all the time. I was just being nosy. And it was actually on Twitter that I saw this job. Um, and I had, in my head, I had this fantasy that I would go from this tiny little yacht design business to a massive corporation. And that would be the thing. I would change my life totally. And for me, I found that most of the really big companies wanted you to have a computer science degree. And they weren't I think I could have done the job. Clearly I could because I ended up getting it, but they weren't even interested in hearing from you. It was like a line. And if you don't cross that line, so be it. So the smaller companies that I was talking to um, who were hiring partners from the academy felt like a more viable prospect. And I did get offered um, a job with, with one of them. But because Accenture were working in combination with this new special graduate scheme at Newcastle Uni, that did mean that I could see this future in a big giant corporation. And that's why I ultimately went for that one. But yeah, it was just a link on Twitter, completely random. Interesting. Yeah, I think Twitter is a really good source of uh, info. It's really easy to miss stuff though, because of the nature of it, it just flashes up. And if you aren't online and you <laughs> see it, then uh, yeah, which I guess is why it's really good, like Beth said, to kind of team up with your classmates and then you can like, uh, share opportunities like so for example for the Accenture one presumably they had a cohort so they were uh, recruiting a lot of people so it wouldn't have made any difference if all of you would have applied you or maybe could have got the job there so um, yeah so Beth um, what is your view on because you've got this you've gamified the whole rejection process and you really want to get rejected you want to count those rejections and you're not counting those things so you're going to badger those folks until they actually say no to you right <laughs> what is your view on um, unsolicited applications? And by that, I mean, you haven't actually seen that place advertise a job, um, but you really want to work there. What's your view on uh, contacting them and how would you go about it? So I 
I didn't do that for any of the computer science um, jobs that I applied for, but pre CS, I've done that before and gotten jobs that way. So um, I was a project manager um, for a nonprofit in Haiti. And I, my first, I've worked in Haiti several times, but my first job I, I got by writing to an organization that I saw had been working in Guatemala. They were starting an office in Haiti. I, I wrote to them and said, I'd like to help you get started in Haiti and they hired me. So it's definitely possible, at least in my experience outside of tech, I assume inside of tech it is as well, but I, I didn't go that route. Okay, um, Beatrice, did you happen to do that at all? No, I didn't go down that route either. I mean, I did send unsolicited CVs, but again, I didn't hear anything back. Um, I mainly use job boards to um, find my current role that I'm in. Ashley, did you apply to anywhere that wasn't advertising, but you really wanted to work there? No, I wish I did, but um, yeah, I, I, I did the same, just applied directly through job boards. That's really interesting. And I think that just because nobody here has done it, it doesn't mean that you can't do it. You never know until you ask, do you? And what's the worst that can happen? We've heard from folks on the panel today that they got ghosted, they got rejected. So I guess the worst that can happen is you get ghosted, isn't it? So for the, the folks that were asking in the chat about unsolicited applications, then uh, go for it uh, and see what happens if you really want to work there. What I would, uh, sorry to um, interrupt Suze, um, what I would advise if you are sending an unsolicited um, CV, do send it to HR, but see if you can find like a manager within that company, find them on LinkedIn and maybe message them and say like, I really want to work for this company because you never know what can happen. That's really good advice, Beatrice. And also, um, just on the back of that, what you often find is that tech companies offer their, in, and other companies, but in tech, um, they offer their employees a uh, recruitment bonus if somebody that they recommend gets recruited and then stays on for a certain amount of time. So if you can um, link up with somebody, say you see somebody on LinkedIn, you really like what they do and you really like where they work, and you get chatting to them and they recommend you, then there's something in it for them as well. So um, that can definitely work out. So we've had a question in the chat. Did any of the panel members feel surprised with what they were met with in their roles compared to when they were training or did it feel like a smooth transition? Obviously, Beth, you, you look like you're quite pensive there. Um, I, I knew going into my job that I wouldn't know what I needed to know. <laughs> so I, I guess I, my expectations were that I would be kind of, you know, hit with a lot of new information and that would be outside of what I had studied and that has definitely been been the case. And how, what were they like with you? Um, what was it, was there mentorship or sort of coaching or? How yeah, they... even though we're, we're all um, working remotely, everyone has been um, just has gone out of their way to, to say, you know, anytime you need help, you can just message me, like, happy to do a chair or a phone call. So um, as long as I know what question to ask, there's always someone to ask the question. Cool. And Ryan, you, you kind of came through route and lift through a couple of different roles where, because they were junior and they were, the nature of them was that they expected you to learn on the job. What was that like for you? Um, you know, to piggyback off your uh, last question about um, getting in unsolicited versus, you know, just applying to job boards, the first time I got into Lyft kind of uh, on the finance route was through someone that I worked with at Deloitte and um, getting a referral uh, through him. So it's definitely feasible. Um, to this question right now about um, kind of what uh, learning was like, there was most certainly a transition. And there were times where, our, you know, I didn't have the best uh, self-esteem or self-worth and uh, kind of told myself, you know, you're, um, you know, not excelling as fast as the other apprentices or um, it, it was definitely a, 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 a transition phase, um, especially going from, you know, feeling rather comfortable in my previous role to now 
feeling like I'm in a completely different space. So leaning heavily on uh, the manager and my mentors in terms of pair coding and um, just really being a, a student in learning the business from a different perspective. Yeah, and I think it's a really important thing to ask as well when you're in the process, when you're in the selection process and in the interviews, um, because the interview, it doesn't matter if it doesn't feel like it is a two-way process. And you need to make sure that you feel comfortable about going to work there the same as they you need to feel comfortable about hiring you. So a good question to ask is, where do you expect me to be in three months' time or six months' time? And what support am I going to get? to get there, um, just so that everybody's on the same page. Because, you know, whenever you start a job, there is always this anxiety that, you know, am I going to pass the probation? Am I going to be confirmed as a full-time employee? And as long as everybody's expectations are the same as what you should be achieving to get to that point, then there shouldn't be any surprises. Unfortunately, sometimes there are. But the more everybody can go in with a shared set of expectations, the better. So in terms of the actual selection process, Ashley, I want to come to you now. Can you talk to us a bit about what the processes were like for you in terms of interviews? And also, did you have to take any tech tests? And what were they like, considering you came from a boot camp? Um, what were they like for you? Oh, man, the, the dreaded technical interview. Um, it's a, uh, <laughs> it was a, uh, so when I got the, when I applied at TaskRabbit, um, there was, four interview steps. It was the first one was the recruiter call where it was just like a phone screen and um, asking these questions and just kind of like was trying to gauge like culture fit wise. Um, I like asked a lot of like culture questions and just questions from my, my resume. Um, and then the, the second interview was a virtual um, tech interview, like, uh, like algorithm, data structure kind of uh, coding challenge um, that was done over, I think, CoderPad. Um, but but yeah, it was just a question. Um, I can't. I, I still remember it. It was like finding a needle in a haystack, and I passed it. And I was so surprised because I was expecting to fail. Um, and then the the second or the third round um, was an on site, but with four interviews. So um, like hiring manager interview. Then there's two other technical interviews. There was like a whiteboarding session, um, and there was also a uh, I'm trying to remember. Um, there was a React. Um, like on-site interview and a Rails on-site interview. So um, it was a very long day, <laughs> um, but it was like just a lot. And I've, since getting the job at TaskRabbit, I've also applied to others just to like, just to see, just to like uh, throw my resume out there and just like keep my skills sharp and stuff. And there's, um yeah, like everywhere that I've applied to has a technical um, interview component. And uh, a lot of companies nowadays are also doing take-home assignments um, which can be nice uh, because you have the time to focus on the work, but also I feel like they tend to give really big prompts that take way longer than what you think it would take. Um, so, so yeah, I don't know. But from coming from a boot camp and going into it, um, we, like the boot camps don't teach you, like they teach you basic data structures, but they don't go into algorithms um, that you will be asked to use, like uh, coding challenges. And so I had to do just like my own self study while I was applying, like reading. My friend Kyle, who did a boot camp prior to, like a year before um, I did a boot camp, he gave me his uh, Cracking the Coding um, interview book, and that was super overwhelming. I was like, I need to learn all of this. This is crazy. They didn't, thankfully, but, um, but yeah. So it's just like post boot camp, expect to be applying for a ton of jobs, but also just kind of doing a lot of um, practicing uh, coding interview style questions, like on um, leak code. Uh, there's also, um, uh, I'm trying to remember the, the name of the other one, but Leak Code is the most popular one. So, so that's kind of my experience. It's definitely very challenging. I, mean, I feel like I got lucky <laughs> when I knew the question, the answer to the question or was able to solve it. So, Yeah, and you mentioned take home tests there as well. And like you say, if you just graduated from boot camp and you are you're basically full time looking for a job, it can be quite good. I think um, it kind of comes with a bit of a health warning because some companies do have re unrealistic expectations, as you kind of touched on there. They will give you a task and say, don't spend any longer on two, than two hours on this. And you'll spend like one and a half hours and you're like, I'm nowhere near anything that I think is going to get me hired here. It's going to take me at least four hours. And sometimes I think that what they're setting you is unrealistic. So um, 
for your own mental health, I think just kind of think about whether or not you do actually want to take that take home test or whether you think it's worth your time and whether you think it's going to prove anything. Um, and try and get the most out of it that you can. Um, see if you can turn it into maybe a portfolio piece afterwards um, so that you haven't wasted your time. So in terms of portfolio, Beatrice, what would you say um, to people about kind of showcasing what they can do for uh, prospective employers? Like, is there somewhere that you had that you pointed people to when you were applying that had kind of things, projects that you've done and stuff? So I did something that was out of like the box. I didn't actually have a portfolio. Um, and the reason behind this is because I think I was like, when I was like going to networking events, I, I kept coming across male who were like junior developers who were male and like, I applied for a job and I didn't have a portfolio. And internally I started thinking like, hold up a second. I'm applying for loads of jobs without, um, with, like without like, why are these men applying for jobs and getting the jobs without a portfolio? So I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to get a job out of a portfolio. I would highly not re recommend that. I would definitely tell people have a portfolio. There's a book that I recently read, um, and if I find it, I'll um, post it in the chat. It was basically saying on your portfolio, have about two to three projects on there, like good solid projects that you know uh, ins and out. Um, look at the job market and like what you're applying for and maybe see if you can make projects that tailor um, that the job market. Um, so I do currently now have a portfolio and I have three projects on there, but they're not like the most perfect project. They're projects that I'm proud of and I can passionately talk about and say like, this is what I learned from these projects. And um, in terms of me getting my job, because I didn't have a portfolio, um, I applied for my job through a website called No CSOK. And like the job description was like, didn't have like a list of like tech stacks. It was just like, can you do this? Did you come from a boot camp? It was very simplistic. And I was like, yeah, I actually tick all the boxes. I'm going to apply for this. Um, and then my interview process, I didn't have a technical test either. I had a one interview with HR and then one interview with um, like a, a senior, a quite high up developer. And we just basically talked about my projects and um, I had an interest in gaming and I had made a small game that wasn't coded, but it still had like the nuance of like coding, like loops. And I spoke about that and I think he really liked it. So I got the role. <laughs> You're lucky you didn't have a tech test. How did you manage that? <laughs> <laughs> but I would advise to people um, practice data um, structures and algorithms. That is what literally tech tests are. Um, and that's something that I'm doing on the side, just learning on the side because I realized from my coding boot camp that we didn't go into depth about it so i'm learning um like data structures and um, algorithms i'm practicing on code wars as well um so that's like coding exercises that are quite similar to what you might get in technical yeah i think a lot of folks in the tech industry including some of the hiring managers who are trying to change it from within are kind of agreed that the whole selection process is broken um and what beatrice is saying is absolutely right um, in the tech test you get uh, tested on algorithms and data structures and in real life when you're doing that role it's nothing like the interview process so it's completely artificial and it does mean that a lot of pe good people get rejected so unfortunately to some extent we kind of have to play the game so use the website uh, leak code and um, actually recommended and code rules that Beatrice just mentioned to to really kind of brush up on that Beth, I'm just wondering, did you have a portfolio or what would you advise folks to do in terms of showcasing their projects? I primarily had um, student projects on my portfolio. Um, and, I, and I do think that if I had had more personal projects, I probably would have been ghosted a little bit less. Um, but um, something that I, I learned when I started applying for things is as soon as you start applying, you, you sort of start the cycle of, of feedback. And so I think it's really good to start applying a little before you think you're ready because then you, you do start to learn things. And so I had been really worried about my, my lack of sort of extensive personal projects. Um, but when I started applying for internships, which was pre-COVID, so I started, I applied for internships in 2000, like fall of 2019. 
And I started getting responses. I mean, I don't think I got as many as I would have if I had had a really strong portfolio, but I did. I was getting sent um, coding challenges, um, a decent number. So at that point, I just decided, you know, I don't think it's worth my time to focus on on projects. I'd rather focus on getting better at interviews. But if I had applied and I hadn't gotten any responses at all, then I would have thought, okay, I need to strengthen my resume by adding some more some more projects. So, um, yeah, I think it's really it's really individual. You're certainly not going to be hurt by adding some great projects to your to your resume, though. Yeah, would you recommend folks um, just do the projects and put them on GitHub, or do you think it's better to to make an actual website to showcase them, or do you think it doesn't really matter as long as you've just got somewhere you can point people? Um, yeah, I don't I don't really know about person I don't have a personal website, but what I've heard is that the most important project things for projects is um, you have them have them on GitHub and you have a really good README. Um, that kind of shows off what the project does and that it, maybe if you can have, um, you know, some screenshots in there or a little a little video demo video, something like that. Um, of course, this is all things I've heard. I don't actually have these things, but uh, I've heard that the README is really the key because people aren't actually going to read through your, your actual code. Yeah, the README um, kind of shows people that you have some understanding of why you've done what you've done and why, why did you choose to use this and, and not that. And also to explain how to use your projects. So if you've created an app, what are the prerequisites that they need to download? What are the packages they need to download in order to run it? How do they get it working on their machine? Um, and things like that. And like you say, they're not gonna read everything. They're not gonna try everything out. And if they come across a project with a blank readme, they're probably just gonna go, onto the next one as well. Unfortunately, it is definitely a case of how do I make their life easier so that they notice me and that this is the game that we've got to play, unfortunately. So when you were, when you were all searching for jobs, uh, I'm gonna to come to you, Jenny. Uh, were there any like red flags that you came across or in retrospect, um, are there any red flags that you now recognize to be um, that you didn't notice at the time? Uh, I guess I'd have a, a couple of different aspects um, to answering that. One is that recruiters who call you up generally don't have your best interests at heart. So when they tell you you're going to be great for this job, that's not necessarily true like make sure you do the research on this job and if you actually do go and interview with that company make sure they know what you can do because it might not be what you can do it could just be what the recruiters told them um i had a guy ring me up and tell me that i was going to be brilliant for a, a dot net job that was about an hour and a half away from my house and i was like okay i've never touched dot net i know nothing about it are you sure that's okay and he's going yeah it's great it's gonna be great you're gonna love it i thought okay right i'm just gonna ignore that one um and the other thing, and I don't, I don't think it's a red flag. I think it's just a symptom of, of COVID and the fact that people that were hiring weren't advertising very many junior developer jobs at that time. Um, I was, I sent an unsolicited email to a company in Bristol and Bath who had previously hired from the academy, but weren't advertising at that point in time. And they got back to me almost immediately um, and so they were really interested and that they had a role that they thought would suit me. And it was really exciting. But as time went on and I got a little bit less nervous of, of pushing them for a, a job description and just a little bit more information. And when I had an interview with them, I really asked a lot of questions about exactly what would I be doing? And it turned out to be much more of a, a tech support role. And I had to withdraw from that saying, I'm really sorry, but I feel like I've just got all this knowledge and it's really fragile. And if I don't implement it quite quickly, it's probably all going to disappear. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if it's a red flag, but when someone's pursuing you quite aggressively, make sure that you know that you are, in fact, what they're looking for and also that they are providing you what you want. Don't just be flattered into agreeing to it. Yeah, that is definitely a good thing. And from my own experience of dealing with recruitment agencies personally I have had the same experience as you described there where they've got a job to fill and 
they're speaking to all the candidates in the same way. They're massaging out every single candidate the same way. It's going to be perfect for you. And what you what you sometimes find with um, recruiters is that even some of the in-house ones. So you know, I've been to meetups and I've met the recruiters that are running the event for that company, and I've said, "What's the tech stack you're using here?" And they said, "I don't know." And I'm thinking, "You're the tech recruiter, so how do you don't how don't you know what tech stack your engineers are using?" Um, so often they will tell you a set of requirements that maybe aren't actually what are needed for the role. So yeah, do be careful about that. I think that's a really good tip. I want to ask about um, salary negotiations. We're just coming towards the end of the uh, of the panel now, but I think this is a really important thing. I think especially for folks from underrepresented groups in tech, there's you know there are certain groups in tech that do have a lot of privilege and a lot of confidence that comes with that privilege. And sometimes they don't have to negotiate because they just get offered a really high salary. Other folks are not, um, and we, we do have to negotiate. Do any of you folks here, I don't want to pick on anybody in case you don't have experience, do any of you folks have experience of salary negotiation and uh, have any tips for anybody? Can I get a nod from anybody who's negotiated? Beth, I'm going to come to you and then I'm going to come to Jenny if that's okay. Sure. So. My number one negotiation tip is that everyone should read the book, Women Don't Ask, even if you're not a woman. It's an absolutely fantastic book about um, negotiation and why women are often much less likely to negotiate their salaries. And I read that book probably 10, maybe 15 years ago, and it really changed how I view negotiation. And I, I think it's very important um, for everyone to negotiate. Um, even if you feel like you have absolutely no power and, you, and you're terrified, still go ahead. Because if you ask for, even if you ask for a little bit more money, if the company retracts their offer because you've asked for a, a small amount of a salary increase, which is a totally normal thing to do, you actually don't want to work there. So that's a, that's a good sign to get before um, before you even start the job that it's not a company you probably want to be involved with. Okay, so you, if you see the salary or they've offered you a salary, um, where, where, at which point would you negotiate? Would you go in first or would you wait for them to offer you something and then think, mm, actually, I want a bit more? What would your advice be there? You should do everything you can to not say number first. Okay, cool. So you're waiting for them to say to you what the, what the amount is? I, I would try to, try to wait until you have an actual offer. Not just that they mention a range and you're still sort of in the interviewing process, like wait until you have an offer written down and you know everything, you know, salary and in the US, the health insurance, that kind of thing, like everything that comes with the, um, with the offer as well. And then start okay. from there. Yeah, okay, and Jenny, you had something you wanted to add to that. Yeah, it's just very kind of baby steps really. When I took, uh, my job it was within a salary range and it was advertised within a salary range um and when i first spoke to them i did say you know this would involve relocation and blah 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 blah, and i wouldn't be able to do it if it wasn't at the top of that range and they were kind of silent on it and at this point i had a few other interviews and i thought this was probably i was least likely to get this job with accenture so i was kind of nonchalant enough to say I won't actually I won't actually go any further unless you can assure me I'll be at the top of that range and then the guy texts me back straight away saying that you will be and that was that was as scary as it got I didn't push it any further than that but I was glad that I forced that point yeah I think it's really tricky as well and I totally hear what you're saying Beth about the um you know not giving your number first I think what's really hard um especially what I've seen in London is that companies don't say what the salary is when they advertise the job and they don't even give a range. So I think it's useful to at least know what the range is because otherwise, like we've heard from Ashley, like we've heard from Beatrice and other folks on this panel, the selection process can be quite long. They can be giving you tests to take home and they can be dragging you in for like four rounds of interviews. And then if you get to the end of that and find out that the salary range is nothing near what what you wanted or what you actually need to live on that can be a bit of a disaster so I would say um, definitely try and find out the range maybe speak to people that already work there especially the men the cis white men find out what they're getting paid because that's a good ruler of what they can afford to pay people or what what they value um, and I would say take it from there and it is scary and a lot of uh, 
employers unfortunately don't appreciate it when um, women negotiate or underrepresented minority groups negotiate like Beth said they can rescind their offer but then uh, I guess if somebody shows you who they are then believe them and just decide that you're not going to work there which is hard because we're in a competitive uh, climate and sometimes we can't afford to be choosy but how are they going to treat you down the line I guess so that brings us to the end of our panel that <laughs> really fast I want to thank everybody on this panel so much for giving up your time, Beth, Beatrice, Ashley, Ryan, and Jenny. I know some of you have got up at the crack of dawn. It's not even dawn yet. <laughs> you can go back to bed um, to join us today and give us the benefit of your experience and uh, share your tips with us today. I really hope that you good folks in the chat there who are watching have learned something and there's something in there that you can... Um, you can use to get your first developer for a job. I know a lot of you are at all different stages in your coding career, but hopefully this has given you some hope that you can do it. Please make sure you make use of code bar resources. And if you do want to go on a boot camp and you don't necessarily normally have access to those, please do consider applying to the Lakers and uh, Code Bar Partnership Boot Camp. Like I said, you've got a good two and a bit weeks to apply for that. So coming up next, we've got Amina. She is going to be talking about how to find your perfect mentor. It's going to be a brilliant talk. I have seen her give a version of this talk before, and you are going to love it. And at 3 o'clock GMT, 4 o'clock Central uh, European time, Beatrice is going to be giving a talk about the power of volunteering. And uh, she's volunteered at loads of places. And it can really, really help your career prospects. So please do catch that. We do have 10 minutes until uh, Amina starts. So if you just want to hang out in the chat, please do. Otherwise, there's a networking tab. And if you click on that, you'll get paired with somebody randomly at the festival for five minutes. It's like speed dating. So check that out. You might meet somebody uh, new and interesting. You might actually uh, get some job opportunities out of it. So yeah, have a fun rest of the festival, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today and look after yourselves. Bye.